Hello, and welcome to the training series for the SU-25T Frogfoot. In this video lesson, you will learn about the various navigation and autopilot modes that the aircraft provides for you. Hopefully you've taken my advice and sought out additional information with regards to the principles of flight and flight mechanics as they will help you significantly in these remaining flight control tutorials. This lesson assumes that you've already watched part 1 and part 2 of this training series. If not, links to them are provided in the description below. The SU-25T's navigation is provided to you through several different interfaces. The primary analog navigation instruments are these two right here. The HSI, or Horizontal Situation indi Indicator, uh, which we briefly covered in Part 1 of this tutorial series, and the ADI, or Attitude Director Indicator. Starting with the ADI on top, you will notice that it looks somewhat similar to the information presented at the center of your head-up display. There's a white virtual representation of your plane at the center of this gauge. There are lines to indicate what your climb and descent rate are in degrees, um, your attitude in degrees, and there's a semicircle of tick marks along the bottom of the gauge to indicate the aircraft's bank angle. One major difference are the two yellow bars in the background of this gauge, the one that's vertical and the one that's horizontal. We'll get to what those represent after we discuss navigation modes a bit later in this lesson. Another major difference is the slip indicator ball, located at the very bottom of the gauge. The slip indicator does exactly that, it shows you how much the plane is moving sideways or slipping through the air and in what direction. This allows you to counter the slip with rudder to maintain a smoother flight path. Allow me to demonstrate with a simple turn. As I bank the plane to the left, you'll notice that the slip indicator slides to the left as well. This actually indicates that I'm slipping to the right. Think of turning in a train or a car. When you turn to the left, you feel your body continue to be pushed to the right. It's the same principle here, except instead of just you feeling like you're being pushed to the right, your entire plane is actually still sliding slightly to the right while you're turning left. This gets back into the principles of flight and flight mechanics material that you were supposed to read up on your own, but just like in the previous lesson where I told you that a turn is actually splitting the lift force between keeping the plane in the air and moving the plane towards the direction, this is the same thing, except it is the forward momentum of the plane that is being split between continuing on the existing straight and level path, say, this direction, and also the momentum change going in this new direction. So you're effectively trying, you're splitting the force in half. Part of the force is going your old direction, part of the force is going your new direction. Similar to drifting in a car, you will eventually start traveling the way that you're facing, but it's not the most efficient way to switch directions. In order to counter the slip, which will result in a sharper, more efficient turn with less energy lost to slippage, you add a little bit of rudder in input in the direction that the slip indicator has moved. Generally, the same direction as your turn. Turning right. Add a little bit of right rudder. Keep the slip ball centered. Turning left. Same thing. The goal is to keep the slip indicator centered at, at all times, as often as you can, as much as you can. Now also, it should be stated that in the context of this simulation, it's not imperative to pay all that much attention to the slip indicator. I mean, you can play the entire game without ever touching your rudder pedals. Um, the plane will slip slightly, but you can generally counter it by changing your turn. So if you have a joystick that doesn't have a, a rudder twist or and or you don't have rudder pedals, um, 
you'll be fine. You, you, I mean, you, you'll find that your turns might not be as maneuverable as someone who is correcting for slip, um, but you shouldn't ever find yourself crashing or catastrophically losing control because of a little bit of slippage. Now let's take a look at the HSI. You'll notice at the top of the gauge there are two numbers. The one says 0, the one says 164. The number on the left is the distance remaining until your current waypoint, while the number on the right is the heading you need to face in order to arrive at that waypoint. There's also two sets of needles, they look like arrows, on this gauge, and they indicate the direction you need to fly to reach the current waypoint, as well as which direction your current flight path is located, is oriented, I should say. The double white bars in the middle of the gauge, I'm sorry, the two white bars, the, the vertical and the horizontal bars, not the needles, are instrument landing localizer and glide slope bars, and we'll discuss them in more detail in the next part of this training series uh, that deals with landing. But let's talk a little bit about the flight path and the waypoints. Oftentimes during the planning stages of a mission, a set of waypoints will be created leading to a specific target or area of operation. The direction of travel between these individual waypoints makes up the pilot's flight path. The flight path will often be set up to avoid as many known enemy anti-air emplacements as possible and keep the pilot out of harm's way as long as possible so that they can effectively reach their targets and employ their ordnance. When looking at the HSI, the yellow arrow indicates the bearing or direction from your aircraft's current position to the currently selected waypoint, and the double white arrows indicate the orientation of the flight path between the previous and current waypoint. If you are forced to deviate from your flight path for whatever reason, be it an unexpected SAM attack or just deviating to investigate something that looks interesting, you can always reacquire the flight path by flying perpendicular to the double arrows with them oriented in the same direction as the waypoint bearing arrow until the yellow bearing arrow has reoriented itself within the two white flight path arrows. Now I'm going to show you a demonstration of that in action. I'm going to go into our F10 map view, overhead map. If we were to start at Kutaisi, which we did, for us it's waypoint 1, and we flew straight to Batumi, which is waypoint 2, our yellow bearing, our yellow waypoint bearing indicator needle would be pointing straight from wherever our position was along this waypoint line to Batumi, to the waypoint. Since that's the direction of the waypoint from our current position. And since we would be on our flight path line, both of those lines would line up. If, however, as we have done, we took off from Kutaisi and flew over Sanaki Kolki first, and then we looked at our HSI. Our bearing indicator needle is going to be pointing from us to Batumi, as we would expect. But our flight path line is still going to be oriented from Kutaisi to Batumi. So if we wanted the quickest intercept to get back to our flight path, we would want to turn to place our current heading, the direction that we're flying, perpendicular to the flight path needles, and fly in that direction. And as you can see, the closer that we end up getting to our flight path needles, the closer the bearing indicator needle is going to be to lining up with those flight path needles again. Once we intercept our flight path, the waypoint bearing indicator will once again be oriented directly between the two flight path needles. It does take a little bit of quick geometry to figure this out, as you want to make sure you're flying perpendicular to the flight path needles in the right direction. If you were to fly perpendicular in the wrong direction, your bearing just get more and more out of line with the flight path needles. If in doubt, you can always fly towards the waypoint bearing first for a little bit, and then that should give you a good indication uh, to determine the best direction to fly to intercept your existing flight pa uh, path or you can always use the flight director. We'll be getting into the flight director very shortly. Now, flying on your flight path is not 
always required, but it is considered best practice to try and maintain your flight path while you are following your waypoints. Luckily, the autopilot can quickly get you back on track and even fly you straight to your target. We'll get that to that in just a second. First, I'm going to go back into our cockpit view by pushing F1. And I'm going to enter our navigation mode by pressing the number one key on the number row at the top of the keyboard. You should notice your head-up display change with a few more symbols and numbers on the screen. And let's go through these one by one. First, the lower left, you'll notice this ENR. That's actually the navigation mode that you're currently in, and it stands for En Route. These are your mission waypoints. They lead you through your mission. If you press the number row number one again, it'll switch to RTN mode, which is short for Return Mode. And that'll direct you back to your origin airport by default, or you can cycle through different airports in the region. We won't get into this navigation mode until the next part of the tutorial series. If you press the number row one one more time, it will cycle to LNDG mode. As you've probably guessed, this mode will provide you with proper glide slope information right on the HUD during landing. As with RTN mode, we'll get into this more in depth in the next part of this series. If we press the number row one key one more time, it actually cycles out of the navigation mode and just gives us a, a clean heads-up display again. But let's go ahead and press the number row one to bring back on route mode. The number on the bottom right of the head-up display indicates what the current waypoint is. It'll automatically increment to the next waypoint once you reach the current one. The number at the bottom of the HUD is the distance to this waypoint, and the circle in the center of the HUD, it's going to be somewhere in the center of the HUD, is the flight director. That's this guy right here. We'll get to the flight director in a moment. It's a little bit confusing, so I want to go over the rest of the head-up display uh, data first. The last two extra items that show up on the HUD when you enter a navigation mode are these number, uh, uh, numbers above your current airspeed and current altitude. These numbers represent the pre-programmed speed and altitude that you should be traveling to reach your next waypoint as specified by the mission planner. And these could also be set up so that you arrive at a specific target at the same time as, say, a group of A-10s that are going to take out primarily tanks, and you might be arriving there to take out uh, enemy radar emplacements, uh, anti-air. So sometimes these numbers are uh, very integral to the mission. It's a pretty good idea if you, if you don't know any better to try and at least maintain the recommended airspeed. But I do want to kind of point out the uh, recommended altitude in this mission. Um, they recommend that we fly to our next waypoint, or our current waypoint, 88 meters above the ground. Now that's pretty low, and to be honest, this makes me think that the mission designer for this particular mission didn't actually take the time to enter an appropriate altitude for this set of waypoints. Not usually a problem. Uh, the default altitudes for each waypoint are generally ground level. Um, and at the moment, this isn't incredibly important, but I want you to keep it in mind because the flight director is dependent on these two recommended numbers. And sometimes if the altitude is not set correctly, if it's set to ground level, uh, the flight director will actually fly you straight into the ground. I'm not entirely sure whether this is a bug or intended behavior, but it has happened on more than one occasion to myself and my friends, including while I was putting this video together. So be mindful of what these values are set to, and the conditions in which you're flying. One more note of importance when flying the SU-25T, waypoint 1 is always the airfield you started from. Waypoint 2 is actually your first real waypoint. If you set your navigation to ENR mode prior to requesting takeoff while you're sitting on the taxiway, the navigation computer should increment it to waypoint 2 automatically by the time you take off. 
but if it doesn't, or if you forgot to, you can always manually cycle through waypoints yourself by holding down left control and tapping the tilde key. This is the key that is just to the left of the number row 1 key. So now we're going to discuss the flight director circle. <clears throat> Here's where the fun begins. The flight director circle is an indication of the attitude you need to hold the aircraft in in order to intercept your flight plan at the recommended interwaypoint altitude traveling towards the current waypoint. So basically, if you follow the flight director, in theory, you should be setting yourself up exactly the way the mission planner intended. We've already um, established that the recommended altitude here is not appropriate for the flight director. So I'm going to go give you a quick demonstration on what you should do, and then I'm going to show you how we're going to compensate for the altitude not being set correctly in this uh, particular mission. Um, so we have, we're set in on route mode, uh, we're set to waypoint 2, which is actually our first waypoint. Uh, we're just flying near Kutaisi, here we are. So here's Kutaisi, this would be our waypoint 1. Here we are. I know, because I've flown this mission several times, that Batu uh, Batu uh, I'm sorry, not Batumi. It's this little uh, small airport over here with all the targets on it uh, in between Kabuleti and Batumi airports uh, that is our waypoint two. So if I look at our HSI, you'll notice that the bearing I need to turn in order to point towards the waypoint is actually coming up. And my flight path, I'm actually flying perpendicular to my flight path right now. So if I leveled out and flew this way, eventually these two arrows would come together and I would be able to just turn to the right and fly straight towards my target. Actually, I don't know if you can notice it, but they are, since I'm kind of flying in that direction, they are slowly getting a little bit closer to each other. But it's not going to be enough to make that big of a difference. Um, the flight director, which is the circle in the middle of our HUD, and is also represented by these two attitude indicator bars on the ADI, is actually telling me <coughs> that I should turn the plane to the left in order to intercept my uh, flight path. So what I'm going to do is show you how that works. Um, before I do that though, I do want to note that it's also telling me to dive steeply because it is trying to get me down to 10 meters off the ground. Now I think that if I go down that low, uh, I will end up hitting the ground, so I'm going to uh, respectfully ignore it and um, give you a, an idea of what it would look like if I actually did what the flight director told me to do. The point is to maneuver the plane so that the circle stays right in between your virtual aircraft indicator like that. Now, like I said, I'm going to hit the ground if I maintain that, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to try and keep it centered horizontally on my HUD, basically right in between the middle of my virtual aircraft but I'm not going to pay attention to where it is uh, on the vertical axis of the HUD. I'm just going to kind of leave it at the bottom. So you'll notice that it had me turn to the left a bit first, and you'll notice that my attitude indicator needles are also level. Now it's having me turn a little bit to the right. What it's actually having me do is intercept this at a nice gentle curve. So by the time I reach my waypoint, both of those needles will actually be aligned. Um, I'm actually going to, now that I've realized that, I'm actually not going to follow my flight director. And I know that I need to fly this direction to intercept my flight path, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my flight path perpendicular to my heading. 
And luckily my flight path is actually 0 to 180 and my heading is 90, so that actually is pretty fitting. And you'll notice that as I fly this direction, my waypoint bearing needle is going to slowly turn itself, or move itself until it is oriented right in between um, the flight path indication needles. And I'm going to wait till it's almost perfectly centered. And then I'm going to turn and follow my flight director again. And what he should do is pretty much orient me perfectly towards waypoint 2. So I'm keeping the flight director in the middle of my HUD, just on the horizontal axis. Again, it would try to drop me down to um, 10 meters off the ground if I were to actually try and meet it, which I don't want to do. That seems a little bit overly dangerous to me. So you'll notice that as I follow it over to the left or to the right, the closer I get to my flight path, it'll actually slide itself a little bit more so that I have to keep basically straightening the plane out to keep it in the center. So it's automatically directing me in the right attitude to fly, the right orientation and everything, to maintain my preset waypoint uh, information. If I'm supposed to be flying towards my waypoint at 2,000 meters in the air, it's going to tell me to climb until I hit 2,000 meters, and then it's going to center itself on the HUD. If I have a very steep climb angle, it's actually going to drop a little bit, so that, I mean, it's going to slowly drop itself until it's centered once I hit 2,000 meters of altitude. If um, I need to turn one way or the other in order to get onto my flight path and maintain my um, bearing to the waypoint, that's what it's going to do. It's going to gracefully, I guess is the word I'm looking for, kind of merge me into the flight path and bearing. So the flight director is actually a really powerful tool. Uh, it's a tool and it's directing you, obviously, so that you can be on your flight path and at altitude to reach your next waypoint. Now that we've covered some basic navigation, along with how the flight director works, let's talk briefly about the various autopilot systems. You're actually going to notice that since we are nearing waypoint 2 at the moment, um, once we get there, we're only 6.3 5.4 kilometers away, uh, once we get there, the waypoint number will automatically increment to waypoint 3, and the flight director will turn to indicate the new attitude that we need to hold in order to head towards our next waypoint. And the needles down here will also change to point to the new uh, waypoint, and these ne uh, bars here will also change to reflect what the flight director is telling them. So here we go, 3, 2, 1, waypoint 3, and that wants me to turn to the right. So if I were to maintain this, I would eventually get to the proper lineup for waypoint 3. Um, I am not going to do that at this point because I want to get into autopilot stuff. Now I want to go over a couple of noteworthy things with regards to the autopilot. The first noteworthy thing with regards to the autopilot in the SU-25T is that it directly controls the trim of the aircraft. The trim of the aircraft, not the flight surfaces, but it actually modifies the trim of the aircraft to maintain whatever function it's performing. This means that if the autopilot is in the middle of, say, turning the airplane to follow a waypoint change, and you disable it in the middle of the turn, the airplane will be trimmed to continue the turn once the autopilot is turned off because the autopilot has not had a chance to recenter everything to put the aircraft back into a neutral 
balance. This is often a very difficult concept to grasp for pilots who are used to an autopilot being a separate entity in other aircraft. Usually you turn the autopilot on, it grabs the control surfaces, it manipulates them however it needs to, and then once it's turned off, the flight controls are returned to a neutral or whatever trim position the pilot was already flying at prior to engaging the autopilot. So it's a difficult concept to get used to. This autopilot will also actively try to fight any control inputs you make while it is enabled. It can lead to confusion, loss of aircraft control, and crashes. So be mindful of the state of the autopilot systems before you start trying to maneuver the aircraft. Let me actually give you a quick demonstration of that. Um, I'm going to put my aircraft into a 30 degree bank and turn on the autopilot mode that holds it at a specific altitude and bank angle. So right now the autopilot is holding me in this orbit bank basically and it's not going to want me to change any aspect of it. It doesn't want me to pull up and it doesn't want me to, to change the turn. Um, and it actually will will fight my input. So here's my stick. I'm going to zoom out so we can see everything here. Um, the autopilot is engaged. The autopilot is maintaining this, this turn. If I try and turn out of this, you'll notice that I can move the stick a little bit then the autopilot m trims the stick <laughs> back to maintain that attitude that it's trying to hold. So I can't actually turn my plane anymore. The autopilot wants to maintain this setting, period. Same thing goes for the other way. If I try and turn more, the autopilot actually fights me and recenters the stick slightly. If I let go of the stick, the autopilot kind of kicks off and then it really quickly kind of torques me back over because it, it's not having any of this. It says, this is what I want to be at, this is where I am. Screw you. Disable me if you want to fly the plane, basically is what it's saying. That being said, the autopilot directly controlling the trim of the aircraft and also not letting you control the aircraft if it's on, um, I'm going to start by saying that Holding down left alt and pushing number 9 on the number row up on the top is how you turn the autopilot off. That's how you disable the autopilot in this plane. That's the first autopilot key you're going to learn is how to turn the thing off. Um, and you're also going to learn that these six little buttons here uh, with the indicator lights on the top of them are your autopilot panel. If any of those are lit up, the autopilot is on. Um, and depending on the autopilot mode, you may or may not be able to make any kind of modifications to the plane. So you'll notice that when I push left, alt, and 9, light goes out, and I now have complete control of my aircraft again, which is how it should be. Uh, another quick hotkey that I'm going to show you, and this is in case the autopilot is disabled while it's in the middle of trying to perform a turn or something, and now all of a sudden your aircraft just does this, and you can't trim out of it for some reason. It, it maybe it's maybe it's trying to perform some kind of really crazy acrobatic thing, and you just can't untrim it. Um, holding down left alt and pushing the number row three will set the plane into straight and level flight autopilot, and um, that is pretty much the way to always get back to straight and level flight. Uh, hold down left alt, tap the number three on the row across the top of your keyboard. So those are, in my opinion, the two most important autopilot modes you need to know. How to disable it and how to get to level flight so that it basically recenters the the um, rudder and bank trim to level. Now what I'm going to do is, as you can see, with straight and level flight, um, there are two indicator lights turned on here. I'm actually going to disable my autopilot really quick. I'm going to set my waypoint to waypoint 2. 
which is that one. And I am going to engage the, the route following with autopilot mode. The autopilot will attempt to follow the flight director, and this is important. It'll, it'll follow the flight director along the specified list of waypoints. So this means that if, in our case, as in our case, the altitude that it's supposed to hold is set to 10 meters, when I hit Alt-6, which is the route following mode, the plane is going to violently bank down to try and get down to 10 meters of altitude, and also turn sharply to try and spin around to get back to waypoint 2, which is now behind us. So here this is... I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Now if I let the autopilot continue to do its thing, I'm going to hit the ground. So I'm going to disable autopilot with left alt 9, and I'm going to pull up. But I did want to show you what tends to happen if uh, a mission planner does not specify altitude, and you try and use the route following altitude or uh, route fo following autopilot mode to get to a specific target. Uh, your plane will look like it's going to crash into the ground because it probably will. Now, if the altitude, the um, requested altitude is set to something sensible um, up there, like it says 300 meters and you're right by the ocean, the chances that you're going to hit the ground are pretty low unless you're about to fly into a mountain. So, before you run, before you engage that particular autopilot mode, um, left alt 6, the route following mode, you do want to make sure that things make sense <laughs> um, as represented to you. So the specified altitude to this waypoint should be a respectable altitude, even if it's low, um, as long as you know or have a pretty good feeling that it's not so low that you're going to be in the dirt, um, that's fine. But you definitely want to keep an eye on that. Um, you can also hit the A key if you're in a navigation mode and it will automatically engage, as long as there's no other autopilot modes set up, um, it will automatically engage the route following mode if you're in either on route mode or return mode or landing mode. And if you are currently in a waypoint mode or an autopilot mode, it'll actually disable the autopilot. It's a little too confusing for some people, so I generally tell people to stick with the left alt number combinations. Um, until they get the hang of it. Or bind them all to joystick commands. If you have a shift function on your joystick, uh, where you can shift the keys and basically make a separate button press for the same key, um, it's useful to have the autopilot set to a bunch of shift buttons. There's, there's seven autopilot modes. So we've currently done the cancel autopilot button, <laughs> which is left alt and 9. We've currently done the straight and level flight autopilot mode, which is left alt and 3. And we've also done the route following mode, which is left alt and 6. And as I've already said, the route following mode will not only follow waypoints, but if you're in the RTN waypoint mode, it'll follow those waypoints to the uh, setup for your landing. And if you are in uh, LNDG mode, it will actually pretty much fly the plane on the proper glide slope. You have to moderate the speed. The autopilot does not have anything to do with the speed of the aircraft, but it will fly the airplane as if the airplane was going to come in for landing. Let's go over some of the other autopilot modes. Um, left alt 1 is attitude hold and what this means is the plane will maintain its current pitch and bank it's useful for maintaining climbs, descents, or turns with altitude changes so if I were flying, if I were going in on a target and I release all of my ordnance and now I pull off the target and I want to climb and turn away at the same time I can hit left alt and 1, and the plane will maintain my pitch and bank, and I can scan for more targets in the area as I climb away to safety. 
Um, I can make sure that there aren't any SAMs being fired at me. Um, this is a great autopilot mode if you need to get away uh, and you need to look around and you don't have a, a track IR or head tracking software. And something to note, my speed dropped significantly during that climb because I'm only at 75% um, engine RPM. So you want to make sure that you speed up if you're climbing or slow down if you're descending because the autopilot doesn't modify your speed. Let me go ahead and do left alt 3 and that'll switch me back to straight and level flight. And I'll show you the next autopilot mode. Let me disable the autopilot. Left alt 9. I'm going to climb a little bit. The next autopilot mode that I want to get into is an altitude hold and a roll hold. So it'll hold your altitude and your bank angle. This is useful if you're flying at an altitude that you want to be at, uh, a nice safe altitude in the air, or at least one where you can um, observe ground targets or observe anything else for that matter. And you want to set up an orbit so that you can spot targets, uh, identify them before going in for an attack run. Since the SU-25T does not have any kind of data sharing um, suites installed on it, it is very difficult for an SU-25T pilot to find and identify targets unless they are radar targets and it can attack them with uh, anti-radiation missiles or unless the targets are very obvious on the ground, like directly at the waypoint that the SU-25 has been sent to. Um, so one way to get a good bit of intel on what you're about to be uh, attacking is to set up an orbit pattern, uh, spot all of your targets, and get a, a sense of where they are on the ground. And then, after you've figured out a general area, pull off and then come back in and attack. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to fly towards my waypoint here, waypoint 2, which is uh, the first target range. Now I'm getting to about 7 kilometers out. I'm actually going to turn this way. I'm going to take a look at my bearing. I'm going to put it at about 45 degrees. There's my airfield down there. And the targets are fairly obvious. You can see them from up here. But if it was uh, a grassy field or a foresty area and I couldn't easily identify my targets, I could pitch my plane over to about 45 degrees of bank. Hold down left alt, tap 2. Now I don't have to put any in input on the stick. The airplane will maintain this um, orbit. And I am free to look down there and say, oh, okay, so there are my targets. It looks like the three here on my end of the runway have already been destroyed. Oh, somebody's firing at those guys over there. Looks like artillery strikes. So I'm going to want to concentrate my fire down this axis of the runway since nothing's been destroyed yet. I, I could do whatever I wanted. I mean, really. I can also see that not only are there targets on the runways, but there are also targets in the fields around the runways. And I don't have to worry about controlling the aircraft while I'm doing this because the autopilot is, is taking care of that for me. So this is left alt 2. It's an attitude hold and a bank, uh, bank hold. So let me go ahead and level off again. I'm going to cancel my autopilot and dive slightly. Speed brake. Pull out. <clears throat> Going a little bit fast. Okay, retract my speed brake. Left, Alt, and 4. 
Now this autopilot mode is a barometric pressure, barometric altitude hold. So as you'll notice, as we get closer to this mountain, my plane is not reacting. It's not trying to follow the terrain. It is holding this barometric altitude. Um, so before I hit the mountain, I'm actually going to disable it and pull my nose up a little bit to get over it. This is useful if, you, if you're flying over a set of mountains and you just want to make sure that you're flying straight and level. Um, honestly, I don't really use this, this autopilot because um, left alt 3 does pretty much the same thing. Um, the uh, level flight autopilot. Uh, this is, I mean, I can't really think of any uses for it, to be honest with you. Uh, I would just do straight and level, and um, if I needed to, for whatever reason. Um, well, I guess it does have its uses. If I wanted to fly at a specified, at a specific altitude, but I also wanted to be able to c control the aircraft, turn it left or right, the um, barometric altitude hold holds it at this altitude, but also allows me to turn the aircraft. So I can I can do maneuvers at a specific altitude. Um, again, personally, I don't think I would ever, I, I haven't yet, and I don't think I ever would, um, do this because it's just as easy to do level flight and then just disable the autopilot and have full control of my plane. Um, and as long as I'm going fast enough, I don't need... I don't need an autopilot to hold my altitude for me. Um, it could be useful if you are inbound on a ground target, I suppose, and you wanted to maintain a specific altitude um, and line up better on a target. Uh, but again, the autopilot's going to fight you. If you if you start pushing down to like go for the target, the autopilot's actually going to going to push back and try and maintain level flight, so it actually might throw you. I would just never use this autopilot mode myself. Um, but you can experiment with it, see if you can find uses for it. Uh, I personally can't because I would rather just not have the autopilot on, uh, but that's my flight preference and yours might be different. Left Alt 5 is a little bit more useful. Left Alt 5 is radar altitude hold. So what I'm going to do is disable my autopilot here. And I am going to turn this way. And I'm going to get a little bit lower to the ground. Let's say about 200 meters off the ground. 250 meters, that's fine. I'm going to hold left alt and 5 and this is radar altitude hold. So what it's going to try and do is maintain my 260 meter radar altitude. As I go into the mountains, it is going to automatically adjust the plane for the changes in the elevation of the terrain. Uh, it does have a limit in the amount that it can actually modify your pitch. Uh, and again, this is not something, it's not going to be moderating your speed, so as it's climbing you're going to want to increase your throttle, and as it's descending you're going to want to decrease your throttle, but it will do a fairly decent job of maintaining whatever altitude you set it at. This is actually a really cool autopilot mode if you want to fly low and fast through mountains. Uh, it might not be the, the smartest idea because, as I said, it does have limits on how much it can modify your plane's attitude to avoid the terrain. Uh, and like right here, we're flying straight into a mountain. I'm getting a little bit nervous. I'm gonna give it full throttle and... Hey, that was pretty skippy. That was close, but um, it worked, so got to give it props for that. But you definitely want to you want to be um, a little cautious when you're running an autopilot because uh, 
I don't trust them. <laughs> you want to make sure that the autopilot's doing what you expect it to do. Like, right now it looks like it's going to... Okay, it's not going to hit the mountain. But it's doing its best. I mean, it's it's old technology, and it's it's doing what it was designed to do. Uh, it's not supposed to fly your plane for you. It's just supposed to help you. Um, before I do actually die, I'm going to turn it off. And if you notice, I actually disabled my autopilot right there while it was in the middle of the turn, and now my plane is continuously banking to the left. Even if I straighten it out here and let go of my stick, the plane will continue to bank to the left because the autopilot is, is managing my trim controls. Um, so let me go over something that I actually have not gone over yet uh, with regards to trim. Let me get out of these mountains so that I don't die. It's not a bad thing. I mean, once you realize that your autopilot is off and your plane is turning one way or the other, it's usually not that difficult to retrim the aircraft so that there is no more spiraling. Um, like right now, I'm just holding the stick a little bit further to the fuel left. Fuel, 1500. And that was just a fuel indication. I'm at about half a tank. Um, but if you look at the stick, you'll notice this white line that runs down the stick and then up the center. Uh, of the front dash here. That is actually the center line of the stick. If I let go of my stick, you'll notice that it goes over to the left, and that is the direction that the aircraft is banking. And once I move it back close to center, the aircraft is almost in a neutral position. It's not it's not turning one way or the other anymore. Um, that center line is actually telling you where the center line of the flight stick is, and these three lights here are actually your uh, trim center lights. You can see that it says trim center. Um, I'm not sure if in the Russian-themed cockpit it's going to say something in Russian, and I'm sure it says trim center in Russian, but if you can't read Russian, uh, that's what these three lights are for. The bottom one is for your rudder, the middle one is for your uh, ailerons, and the top one is for your elevator. <coughs> but the most important one is generally the, uh, the ailerons one, because those are the ones that control your turning. So since I know that I'm kind of being forced over to the left. I'm just going to give myself a bit of right trim here until the plane is centered. And once I get the stick trimmed to center, you'll notice that the aileron center light comes on. I'm also going to try and give myself a little bit of nose down trim here. Level myself out. And that could have just as easily been accomplished by pushing left alt and three. Uh, the plane would have automatically leveled itself for level flight. But it's sometimes good to just check yourself and make sure that you still know what you're doing. Now, in any of these modes, you can hit the um, left alt and tilde key to temporarily disable the autopilot and then once you let go, it will resume the autopilot mode that you're in. So, for example, if you were in... Let me disable this. If you were in uh, left alt 1, which is the attitude and bank autopilot, where I could climb at a specific angle and a specific bank, and then turn on the autopilot. If I climbed a certain amount of height in the air, like say 3,000 meters here, I'm, I'm looking at my targets. They're getting a little far away for me here. So I look and I see that I'm at 3,000 meters. I'm like, okay, that's a little too high. I can hold down left alt and tilde, and you'll notice that the light goes out on the autopilot. I can reorient the aircraft. Let's say now I want to fly at a very slight descent. Same same bank angle. I just want to get a little closer to the ground. Now if I let go of tilde, the aircraft will hold the new... It basically...
turns off the autopilot and then like re uh, resets it at the current settings for the aircraft. So now I'm f flying at a very slight descent rate, um, but I didn't have to, I didn't have to left alt nine and then left alt one again. It was just a left alt tilt, and as we can see now I'm flying just a little bit too. sharp of a turn, so I'm going to level out a little bit. Still doing left alt 1. Uh, I just used alt tilt to temporarily cancel. Now I'm flying over the sky. I want to get a little bit better angle on him. Let go of alt. Let go of tilt, actually. Um, and there we go. I can, I can reorient my plane as I am using the autopilot, which is kind of a cool feature. This basically concludes this lesson on navigation and the various autopilot modes that are available to you in the SU-25T. Uh, I highly recommend you get some practice with these various concepts and the different modes of both the navigation and the autopilots. Um, there's a frequently used keyboards command link uh, in the video description. Uh, it's linked to a post uh, on the Eagle Dynamics uh, forums and it's laid out in a very nice and organized fashion. And it should provide you with a nice cheat, sh cheat sheet for all the control information that I've presented in the first three parts of this tutorial series. Uh, also, if you haven't already, I still strongly recommend you do some further reading on the principles of flight and flight mechanics. That is definitely good uh, knowledge to have. Um, in our next lesson, we will put all of the skills that we've learned up to this point to the test and we're going to cover landing which is generally thought to be one of the most difficult skills to learn in an aircraft uh, it's also generally considered to be the most dangerous time to be in an aircraft is during the landing a lot of people call landings a controlled crash um, and they're not very far off from the truth um, we're also going to go over rearming and repairing your aircraft once you're safely on the ground and finally, we're going to go over the shutdown procedure for once you're finished with a sortie. So you've gone out, you've done your mission, um, you might have come back, rearmed, repaired, if you have any damage, uh, go back out into the, into the field, take out a couple more targets, you've taken everything out that's uh, of importance and you're done for the day. Uh, I'm going to show you how to shut down the aircraft um, once you're done. So that's uh, what's on the roster, that's what's on the schedule for the next lesson. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.